All right, so my Patreon supporters have already seen this thing, at least taken its first uh, turns, but we did that with the small batteries. And one of the things I noticed was just how quickly the batteries depleted. But again, they're the small batteries. This time, however, we're using the three 6,000 milliamp hour batteries, putting out roughly 46 volts. Uh, we've got current on here. We're gonna give this thing a shot. I'm actually wearing a very thick winter jacket, even though it's spring, and a face shield, because I don't totally trust it. Let's see what happens. Look over there! <laughs> That's insane. So, we, we did have a voltage drop there. It dropped down to about 35 volts. It was holding steady just under 200 amps. Which means, I thought ahead. That's a good thing I thought ahead. You will notice, face shield keeps falling down. You'll notice that this little loop, wow, these cables are hot. Batteries, warm. Ooh, that's gonna need some cooling. So everything's pretty goddamn hot. The motor's warm. That's freaking smoking hot. So that's gonna need a cooling fan. We have a plan for this. And, of course, we need to add more power. But you saw it was blowing the foliage, you know, a good 20, 30 feet away. In fact, it started moving itself on this stand, and that thing's not light. Well, it works. And it works quite well. And it's very terrifying. Well, that was fun and exciting, and the best thing about it is it worked and it didn't blow up. In fact, uh, you saw it blowing the foliage some 30 feet away. That was kind of cool. Uh, you know, the batteries, they held up well. Uh, so, thumbs up to Z. Z, however you pronounce that, but whatever. Uh, they held up well. They actually didn't drop much in terms of uh, voltage after the fact, so they have plenty of capacity for what we're trying to do. In fact, uh, I don't know if you were counting, but that was almost a 30 second runtime. I am definitely not planning for this thing ever running more than 10 or 12 seconds at a time. So we're good to go there. Uh, one thing that was a concern as far as the power issue goes are these 10 gauge cables and the batteries. They got uncomfortably warm. So that's one thing we have to resolve. Uh, I did hint at this little loop uh, being in the, the battery cable connection. The idea here is I've got another battery coming because I had a feeling there would be voltage drop and there was considerable voltage drop. We started out at 46 volts. By the way, it's worth noting that I did not actually charge these batteries. I just, they, they were in storage charge, which is why we got to 46 volts instead of just over 50 volts. Uh, it's a storage charge. It's how they were shipped. The cell balance is like unbelievably perfect. They're within one one hundredth of a volt. In fact, most of them are the same. There's only one that's down maybe just a hair. And once again, one one hundredth of a volt is, is nothing. So the batteries are great. Happy with the batteries. Uh, cables, not so happy with this. Plus, you know, I mean, just look at this mess. What are we gonna do in the car? Is this gonna be flying around like scorpions in the mail killing people? No, so I've gotta make some kind of housing for this. And I have a game plan that both makes a housing as well as eliminates most of this wiring. Uh, the battery cables themselves are still gonna get warm. There's just not much we can do about that. That's just sort of the nature of the beast, short of actually cutting these shorter. The shorter the cables are, the less resistance they'll have, the more current they can flow, you get the picture. But what's interesting is that this section of my little cable contraption is eight gauge. These were not even warm. It was the 10 gauge stuff that really couldn't tolerate that, that power. And here's another interesting thing. So we hit, somewhere over 30,000 RPM, I believe it was. And we were running 
at 35 volts, we were running a little over half the voltage we could. And I don't know if you noticed, but when I was adjusting the servo tester, when the things, you know, when I first powered it up, that wasn't even half power on a little more than half the available voltage that we're ultimately gonna have. And that's when this thing decided to start blowing itself backwards. And this thing is not light, especially with that base. I haven't weighed it, but if I was gonna estimate, you're looking at an easy 20 pounds here. Uh, maybe more than that. And with the base, it's probably, you know, closer to 25 or so. So, you know, that was kind of impressive. I'm glad I just didn't give it full power right off the bat because it, I probably wouldn't have caught it and it would have blown itself off the table and then we'd be crying. So this is all good. That means there's a lot of power to be had. Uh, there's a lot more, but again, addressing the weak links. So first one is the cables. I have already ordered some Delrin. I have some quarter inch thick copper stock in the garage. I'm basically gonna make a bus bar kind of arrangement where with the actual connectors literally soldered into the bus bar itself. So any voltage drop that we got, you know, these cables were probably, if I had to guess, worth at least a volt of that voltage drop that we saw. So, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna make life better all around. So that's, that's the plan there. But what I really wanted to do is take a look at how this thing fared. So, you know, this is the sort of inspection cover. This is the original input shaft hole, obviously, which we don't have anymore. Uh, I had a piece of gaffer's tape on it just to keep dust out of it, but you can't see it in the video very well. So I took a picture of it and I'll cut that in here at this point where you can actually see the, uh, the Kluber lubrication Isoflex NBU 15. I just like saying that. Uh, where, where that kind of spread out past that Teflon washer. And the Teflon washer that you'll look at in that picture is actually the thin one that I mentioned was, was sort of concave. So I probably overfilled the bearings because, you know, the engineer guy, Steve, I mentioned, was his name. Uh, he actually told me to fill them 30%. Well, you know, I can't really judge that. It's kind of hard to judge. And I know things are going to spray out as they have. So that's another reason. So you had the drag from the Teflon washer and you also had the drag of the over lubrication, but that's kind of self clearancing itself. What I really want to look at is how our hex drive did and how the actual, uh, if there's any play, if this is loosened up, you know, there's no, there's no axial play. This, this is not moving. It's, it's nice and solid. So let's go ahead and take a look here. And while I'm doing this, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the other plans. So the ESC is the thing that got the hottest. That was the most concerning thing to me. That getting as hot as it did tells me a couple of things. Once again, a shout out to Thomas at Castle Creations because he said that Castle would not rate that ESC at 300 amps. They would rate it for 200 amps. And it got uncomfortably warm to the touch after about 25 seconds of running. And most of that wasn't even full tilt. In fact, to be honest with you, if you go back and look at the video, you'll see that, you know, for the vast majority of that time, it wasn't, I, I don't think I ever actually turned the knob all the way up. I think I did once towards the end. Uh, it didn't really make a difference in speed, which perhaps, you know, you don't have to go all the way to um, 10 milliseconds on the pulse width. But whatever it was, you know, it was enough to get that thing hot. And I'm kind of kicking myself a little bit because, you know, I sort of trust, and I knew I shouldn't do this, but I sort of trusted the specs. They said that's a 300 amp ESC that can handle 16 cells at 16 S and all this other great stuff. And, uh, you know, clearly that's very optimistic. So the heat sink on it is really undersized. Uh, the, where is this thing? right here. So the heat sink on this thing is very undersized. It's kind of ridiculously small for the capacity that they're trying to push through it. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, we're very likely going to take this thing apart and see if we can put a water cooling block on here, because that's one thing I know I'm going to have to do for the motor, because the motor is going to live under the uh, under hood in the engine compartment. So since it's there, it's going to be exposed to engine temps. And by the way, I have a pack of uh, six gauge welding cable that I will build extension leads for the motor leads. That's what's gonna run out there along with a couple of tubes for a water cooling jacket to keep the, ha to keep the motor nice and happy. Um, 
And again, that same circuit, maybe a different pump, will be uh, a water cooling block on this heat sink. So anyway, I'm, I'm losing track of where I am here and I apologize for that. That was just really exciting. That was really cool to see this thing actually work and not blow up. So, you know, there, there are issues. I may have to, and I probably should have thrown down the extra 50 bucks for the, the one that's rated 300 amps uh, continuous and, no, no, I'm sorry. It's rated 400 amps continuous and 450 peak. This one is rated 300 continuous and 400 peak, but <laughs> no. It's not, uh, you know, if it's not enough, then it's not enough. We, again, you know, it's going to be another video. We'll take, cut this, uh, heat shrink wrap off, see if we can remove the actual heat sink. Worst case scenario, I suppose I could just mill the fins off and use the existing aluminum surface for the water cooling block, but you know, we'll figure that out. Worst, worst case scenario, we will actually have to just throw down for another ESC. Uh, you know, because it's, we, we can't let it run as hot as it did. And if I can get this heat sink off, then we can take a look and see what kind of MOSFETs are on there and see what they're actually rated at. Because, you know, Chinese ratings aren't necessarily reflective of reality. As far as I was going to make a coronavirus joke, but I'm not going there. Um, anyway, let's take a look at the actual hex drive and let's see what this looks like. Haven't looked at it yet. We're seeing this for the first time together. So as far as the actual section here, what am I seeing? I'm actually seeing what looks like a, there's like a little shaving of steel in there. Is that steel? Let's see. Feels like it. So let's see where that came from. Well, you know what? That looks actually pretty good. You know, and again, this is meant to be our mechanical fuse. So if this thing actually fails, <laughs> just put another one in. But that looks pretty tight. When I say tight, I mean that in the colloquial way, as in good. But where did that little piece of metal shaving come from? I wonder if maybe I should try to work that bolt out and we can really take a close look at it. So let's flip it over. Now remember how sort of stiff it was from the excess lube and the drag or the Teflon before. So basically after, uh, you know, like 30 seconds of runtime, it feels good. There's still a little bit of drag on there, which I'm actually okay with because we know that that drag is going to just loosen up. There is absolutely no axial play in this thing. No lateral play either. It works nicely. No scarring on the, the volute. Uh, you know, everything looks good. And the other thing that you guys uh, should keep in mind is that because it was spinning in free air, you might be inclined to think, well, it's going to be different on the motor. Well, yes and no. When you run it this way, when you run it open-ended like this, there's a couple of things to keep in mind with a centrifugal compressor like a centrifugal supercharger like this or a turbocharger, the compressor side, it is an actual compressor. It's not just merely a blower. So it is actually compressing the air inside the volute. What the actual pressure ratio is, I don't know. I tried to look it up. I couldn't find it. But, you know, I seem to recall like turbos and, and things like Vortex are somewhere around a 1.2, 1.3 internal pressure ratio. So, you know, 1.3 internal pressure ratio is roughly five PSI. So this thing was actually working. And because it was exposed to the air, if I had the guts, which there's no way I'm doing this, if I covered my hand over the inlet, uh, it actually would have taken load off and it would have traveled off the compressor map uh, into the surge zone, I believe. Uh, that would have, you know, and that's not good for the bearings and everything else, but, um, it would have actually done less work and the current draw would have dropped. We saw that on the small uh, contraption that we dynoed on that uh, Harley. So it was doing work. It was generating some effective boost. If the engine consumption matches that effective boost, then that 1.3 pressure ratio is what we would get. So that was actually under load. But if you do the math, 35 volts, roughly 200 amps, that gives us, what is that, uh, 7,000 watts. This motor is rated for a peak of 
15,000 watts and 7,500 continuous, but you know, kudos to the motor. It barely got warm. It was in great shape. So we know it can take a lot more. Again, the weakest link is the ESC and we'll see if water cooling deals with that. If not, it's going to have to probably be another ESC. Uh, cables again, we've got that taken care of. So anyway, everything looks pretty good. This actually, honestly, I was expecting this to be like completely loose and it's not, it just, feels like a nicely lubricated ball bearing thing you know and i still do feel some pressure from the uh, teflon not much but it's still there but you know it definitely turned out well so there you go that was our test uh stay tuned there's a lot more to come and we're going to be getting this guy on the car pretty darn quick so stay tuned thanks for sticking with me and subscribe